Hey, I'm Jim Richards. I want to welcome you to message number seven in this series, Faith Righteousness, the Ultimate Revelation of God. Today, we're going to be talking about the promise of righteousness. Now, I go into this in the audio series into much more detail because I can take more time to deal with this, but this is the crucial point of faith righteousness. Now, remember, the Apostle Paul told us in the book of Romans that uh, the Gentiles who did not seek righteousness found righteousness because they sought it by faith. The Israelites who sought righteousness couldn't find righteousness because they sought it as if it was by works. Now, I want you to understand that they always knew that righteousness did not come by works. Abraham, who was the father of the nation of Israel, uh, obtained righteousness from God by faith. And uh, the promise that God made to the nation of Israel through Abraham was based on faith righteousness. It was not based on works righteousness. Now, don't get confused here. I'm not, I'm not talking about some mystical concept of righteousness where you where you claim righteousness, but you live like the devil. And, and I, I tell you, sometimes you think that's what people are preaching. I don't think people intend to imply that, but, uh, but there is little emphasis among people who, who feel like they're teaching faith, righteousness, and grace to put no emphasis on the value of living a righteous life. As a matter of fact, uh, behavior is kind of de-emphasized and considered to be carnal, but behavior is the fruit of righteousness, and behavior is where people see uh, God in our lives and where we actually have a manifestation of righteousness that influences the world. So behavior is incredibly important. Now, behavior needs to come from uh, the heart and he's being motivated by love and motivated by a passion for righteousness. But at the same time, uh, it's not a performance that you do to earn something from God. Now, I want you to remember that the Bible tells us in Habakkuk 2 that the just or those who have been declared righteous have always, always lived by faith. You know, there were always two forms of righteousness. And uh, there was works righteousness, and then there was faith righteousness. Now, works righteousness was an attempt to perform everything that God told you to perform, the way that he told you to perform it, in order to qualify for his blessings, his acceptance, his approval, and his promises. Well, no one can live up to that. As a matter of fact, the the very law that people try to live up to to earn righteousness says that the only way you can earn righteousness is you have to do everything that is written in the law. And if you fail at one point, then you have you have no righteousness before God. And so righteousness has always been an impossibility based on our performance. And uh, the only possibility of righteousness is the righteousness that comes to us through the promise that God actually ultimately made uh, to the Lord Jesus and, and through the Lord Jesus. But all through the Old Testament, people lived in righteousness because they received righteousness, or they experienced righteousness as a result of faith. Now, one of the things that we really misunderstand about Abraham as the as the father of faith righteousness, and he is the father of faith righteousness, but we we misunderstand this. And I have, you know, I've misunderstood this throughout my much of my life as a believer. And you know, I have always been a believer in faith righteousness, but uh, I still had a lot of misunderstandings about faith righteousness, and I've had to grow in this as I've studied the scriptures, I've walked it out in, in real life. And so there's this general concept that uh, God called Abraham righteous 
And because Abraham believed he was righteous, then that is the basis for faith righteousness. In other words, faith righteousness is believing that when God calls you righteous, that you are in fact righteous. Now, I think that there's some legitimacy to that. I'm not, I'm not totally discrediting uh, that concept, but that's not actually what happened with Abraham. Uh, Abraham didn't believe that he was righteous just because God call, called him righteous or, 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 or imputed righteousness to him. As a matter of fact, if you go back and study the life of Abraham, you discover that, in fact, what God did is that God actually declared uh, Abraham's identity and Abraham's destiny. And because Abraham believed that identity and that destiny, then that is what God counted uh, as righteousness. So Abraham believed he was who God said he was, and he believed that he and his descendants would live the destiny that God said they would live. Now, I want, I want you to understand something. Faith righteousness for the new covenant believer, you know, the difference is God is not just declaring us as righteous. God is actually empowering us with righteousness. In other words, it's not just a position. It's not just a legal standing before God. It is a power that actually works in us through what the Bible calls grace. If you read Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, you, you discover that, that we are declared just or righteous by God, and we, we, that brings us into a place of peace. And that we come into this place of peace, and then we uh, believe God, uh, and we experience the grace of God, and grace empowers us and make us makes us capable of standing in that which God has declared about us. So there's this whole continuum that starts with being declared as being righteous, uh, that moves all the way into sanctification, which is the experience of righteousness, which moves into glorification, which is the expression of righteousness in our life. It's a continuum. It doesn't just it doesn't just end with the idea that, okay, we have been declared righteous. But with Abraham, it's so important to realize that he first accepted his identity. Now, keep in mind, and, and by the way, this is so uh, incredibly important uh, because, you know, Abraham, he, he was old, and the, you know, the promise to him was that through uh, his seed uh, that would come forth out of his loins, that uh, that all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Now, Abraham, you have to understand, he, he, he made a lot of mistakes. He had a lot of failures. He tried to take control of this process and tried to bring about this, this promise in a way that he understood or in a way that made sense to him. And then ultimately, God said, no, you know, you're not going to do this through Hagar. You're going to do this through Sarah. You're not going to do this through Ishmael. You are going to do this uh, through Isaac. And so, and so, time and time again, God had to get uh, Abraham back on course uh, so that he could live this promise. But no matter what his failures were, Abraham continued to believe that the promise was good. So, so Abraham has this promise. Now, we have a promise of a new identity in Jesus. And so faith righteousness for us, uh, just like it was with Abraham, doesn't stop by just saying, oh, I'm righteous and I'm going to live any way that I want to live. And, and you know, I'm going to compromise and, and uh, it's all right for me to be in sin. My behavior doesn't matter and all that kind of stuff. No, that's, that's not what God's talking about. It's not what the Bible's talking about. If we believe the identity that God has given us as children, as heirs, as, uh, as the righteousness of God in Christ, then we 
believe that we are empowered to live that, and that becomes a part of our whole pursuit of walking with God, is to be able to live a life, number one, that doesn't keep us bogged down in sin and death, and that also glorifies God in the world, and that attracts people to God. Keep in mind, uh, Adam failed at his call and his destiny to uh, to have authority in the earth and to manage the earth in a way that showed all people who God really was. And then God gave that that same promise to the children of Israel. They failed at it, and, and instead of becoming a, a house of prayer for all the nations of the earth, they sought to dominate the world, and they, they thought they had superiority to the rest of the world because God had chosen them. And pretty much the church has done the same thing. Most of the last 2,000 years of the church has been the church trying to find a way to rule over and to dominate the rest of the world and force Christianity or their version of Christianity down the throats of the world who doesn't want it. And so, you know, from Adam all the way to the modern church, we have failed to accept our identity and let our identity, let who we are in Jesus glorify God and become an influence that draws and compels people to walk with God. But I want you to understand something. There is more to this promise than just than just that, but I, but I wanted to kind of lay that out. I hope that makes sense to you. Like I said, I go into great detail in the audio version. It's because I have a lot more time to, to discuss it. But I want you to realize that God made a covenant with Jesus, and in this covenant with Jesus, and you know we we learn about the covenant in Isaiah fifty four. Isaiah fifty four dis, uh, describes this covenant that God made with Jesus as the covenant of peace, and God, after the cross, God made peace with the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, never again would he pour wrath out on him. And, and then he provided all of these promises and said that his kindness would never depart from him. And so God made a covenant with Jesus. Now, when we are born again, we are baptized into Jesus. Now, Jesus has already obtained the righteousness of God through his resurrection. And so as the righteousness of God, he becomes fully qualified for, to receive this inheritance that God has offered him. Uh, because he is righteous and he is raised up in righteousness, he is also the one that oversees the covenant uh, to ensure that it is upheld, that it is not changed, that we are not cheated out of our covenant. And so, you know, I've touched on this before, but I want to touch on this again. It is so very important that we do not have a personal covenant with God, uh, but instead Jesus has a covenant with God, and because we are in him, we get to share in the covenant that God made with him. Now, this is the typology that we see in Abraham, the nation of Israel, ultimately the Lord Jesus, and the church all get to participate in a covenant that God did not individually make with us. And this is the reason the covenant is sure. This is the reason that uh, all the promises are ours. This is the reason we are all delivered from the curse of the law. Even though we don't deserve those things, we have those things because Jesus obtained that inheritance from God the Father himself and when we were born again, we were baptized into him. And it's just so important that we understand that. You know, in, uh, in Galatians 3.15, Paul was speaking, and he's trying to explain the covenant. And he says that he's speaking after the manner of men. And he says, so, verse 16, he says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made, but he doesn't say, uh, to his seeds as in many, but as of one, and to your seed, your individual seed, and the seed that he is referring to is Christ Jesus himself. 
So God made a covenant with Abraham that was to Abraham and ultimately to his seed, and his seed was Jesus. And in Jesus, we have all of the promises of God starting with our identity. Uh, our identity is that we are sons of God, we are children of God, we are born of the Spirit of God, we have been made righteous, uh, we are qualified for all of Jesus' inheritance in the kingdom, all the promises of God are always yes for us, none of the curses of God are ever yes for us. So all of these things we have, not because we deserve it, not because we earned it, but because Jesus himself earned this. You know, the whole concept of confessing Jesus as Lord when we get born again is based on whether, whether or not we heard the scriptural explanation of what happened on the cross with the Lord Jesus, what happened in the grave with the Lord Jesus, and what happened in the resurrection with the Lord Jesus. And when we see what Jesus accomplished on the cross, in the grave, in the resurrection, then we understand that he is worthy to be our Lord. He is worthy that we should surrender our life because he became our sin. He took the curse. He took the punishment that we deserve. He conquered death. He conquered Hades. He conquered all principality and power. He was raised up in newness of life. He obtained resurrection life. And he shares that resurrection life with ours. And so based on that, he is worthy to be our Lord. So we surrender every aspect of our life to him um, because he's worthy. It's just, it's just that simple. We look to him to discover and know everything that we're ever going to need to know about God, everything we're ever going to need to know about the promises. And so... Uh, so, you know, Romans, again, Paul talks about this, how that in the Romans, or in the book of Romans, that Abraham modeled to us that he did not become the heir through the law, but he became the heir through the righteousness of faith. Well, it's the same way for us. We do not become heirs to all of the good things of God, but we become heirs uh, through the promise that God made to the Lord Jesus. I hope this, I hope I'm not making this too hard to understand, but this is just so very much to grasp in one 27 minute message. And uh, in Romans uh, chapter four, uh, Paul goes on to say, now it was not written for his sake, for Abraham's sake alone, that it was imputed to him, that righteousness was imputed to him, but also for us. And it shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered because of our offenses and raised because of our justification. So, so the, the story of Abraham was given to us as a model of how this faith righteousness thing worked in the Lord Jesus, just as righteousness was imputed to Abraham for believing, righteousness is imputed to us for believing in what Jesus accomplished through the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And so, just like Abraham uh, was, was promised this, this identity and promised this destiny, we have been promised an identity and we have been promised a destiny, and, uh, and, and, and we receive that promise and that destiny uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, to me, it is, such, it is such a phenomenal thing that we have um, Abraham that shows us how he had to walk out his faith and how that he would go through these struggles where he would where he would waver and then he would always do something to go back and establish his heart in this promise of God and actually Jesus modeled the same thing when you read the book of Jonah the second chapter about what Jesus had to do in the grave 
where uh, you know where once he became our sin he was held in the grave he was alienated from god uh, he was separated from all the promises of god and he followed the example that abraham gave us and then we look at abraham and we look at jesus and we realize that whenever our identity whenever our righteousness is challenged that we do the same thing that Abraham did, and we do the same thing that Jesus did, we recover our heart, we recover our faith um, so that so that that we don't waver. You know in uh, in Romans chapter four, uh, verse seventeen, we have a reminder of the promise that uh, that God made to Abraham where he says, I have made you a father of many nations. Now, remember, God said this to Abraham when he was an old, impotent man, and he and Sarah had not conceived and could not conceive. And But he says, I have made you the father of many nations. In fact, he changed his name. You know, one of the things that I think is so incredible, and, you know, God may share this with you if you seek this with him, but the Bible tells us that when we came to Jesus, he gave us a stone with a name on it. It's a new name, and we have a new name with God. And, and uh, you know, like Abraham, his name was Abraham, and it was, I mean, Abram, and it was changed to Abraham, which meant the father of many nations. And so, so it says that I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Now, I want you to understand something. God calls us righteous, and we may struggle with our righteousness. We may struggle with sin. You know, being free from sin does not mean that we never sin. Being free from sin means we are free from the power of sin. If we sin, it is not because a sin has power over us. If we sin, it's because we are struggling in our faith. We are struggling in who we are and what we have through Jesus. And so Abraham had this promise of being the father of many nations, and he struggled. He made all these all of these bad decisions. And so even though he his body was dead and uh, had it was a physical impossibility for him to bear a seed out of his own loins, and then of course ultimately through whom all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Uh, it, it's the same way with us so many times. It seems like living in this new identity is an impossibility. Now, this is not where you just want to say, okay, I'm just going to, I'm going to walk around and confess that I'm righteous with no commitment to righteousness. You know, the word confess is really interesting because the, first of all, the word confess means to say the same thing. So it's a compound word, but the second aspect of that comes from the Greek word logos. So I need to be saying the same thing that the Logos of God says. But a confession, if I'm saying the same thing, not only am I saying what God says about me, but I'm also believing it in my heart. You know, my whole life, I've always taught that faith is always found in three places. It's found uh, in the Word of God, it is found in our heart, and it is found in our mouth. And when you believe something in your heart, it changes your behavior. It changes your sense of identity. And when your sense of identity changes, then you have, you experience grace and you have the power to live in this thing that you believe in your heart. So in our hearts, like Abraham, we, we constantly have to go back. And when we waver, when we struggle, when our heart condemns us, when we get into unbelief, we have to go back and reconnect with God and reconnect with this promise about who we are and about what we have in Jesus. You know, I think about all the things that Abraham did and all the things that God had Abraham to do to get him to recover his faith and to establish his heart and his identity. Stop and think about it. You know, 
And one of the times that Abraham was wavering, God called him outside of his tent and said, look, look up at the stars, count the stars. And, you know, I can just imagine Abraham out there trying to count the stars. And, and you know, I, I have a lot of funny stories that I tell about that. But the point was, as Abraham is trying to count these stars, God says, look, you can't count them. And he said, he said, this is what your offspring shall be. It'll be like the multitude of the stars that fill the heavens. So, so Abraham went back. He, he looked at the stars. He reconnected to the promise of God. He did these things uh, to uh, inspire his heart to believe the truth about who he was and what he had. You know, another time God took Abraham, so like, like, Abraham, pick you up a big handful of sand. I count the grains of sand. And so Abraham's looking at the grains of sand. Abraham, I mean, God is like, this is how your offspring shall be. So, you know, we have to do many things, first and foremost, by connecting to God. And then God will show us ways to, to influence our heart to come back in touch with the promise that we are the righteousness of God in Christ. We are qualified for all the promises of God, the inheritance that God gave Jesus is ours. All that Jesus has is ours. And when we believe that in our heart, the great thing is it's going to change the way we live. It's going to change the way we treat people. It's going to change the influence that we have in the world around us. So I want you to understand that we have the promise of righteousness, but that promise was made to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the question is, do I want that righteousness? I mean, do I just want the position? Do I just want the title? Do I just want to be declared righteous? Or do I really want to live a righteous life that affects the way I influence the world around me? I want to tell you something. God's called us to righteousness, uh, not works righteousness, not performance righteousness, not righteousness that tries to earn something, but a righteousness that is a fruit of the Spirit of God working in our lives and in our heart. You know something? I hope you'll go check out our, our website. I got thousands of free videos online. But also, I'd like for you to consider becoming a world changer with us. We are starting Bible schools all over the world with the intention of raising up one billion disciples unto the Lord Jesus Christ. You might want to consider becoming a world changer financially, helping us change the way the entire world sees God. Be sure and share this with people. If you're watching this on YouTube or other places that you can, be sure and like this so other people get to hear this message. And I'll be sharing another great message with you about faith righteousness next week.